Uh, Brother Wright, is it true that a saint, lay leader, second man, assistant pastor, etc., can only rise to a spiritual level of those in authority over them? If it is true, how can leadership be encouraged, assisted, compelled in their relationship with the Lord to greater heights spiritually? If leadership does not move forward, what can those under that leader do to move forward and remain submitted to authority? Thank you for considering this question. Looking forward to this, uh, to the answer. So uh, that is a very important, but also obviously a very delicate uh, question. So uh, let me share some things with you here. In fact, in my opinion, this is one of the most important questions that you uh, could consider because of the fact that uh, we all want to be submitted to God's authority and those that he has placed and rule over us, but nobody wants to be held back. So let's, let's look at this for a minute. Probably one of the most amazing places in all the scripture is uh, found in Matthew 23, beginning with verse 1, uh, especially in relation to this question. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe or obey, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Now that's just about as <laughs> just about as restrictive of leadership you can possibly find. And I remind you who's speaking here, uh, the Father God is speaking through the man Christ Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he says. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The Greek word there for sit is not just to sit in a seat. It is officially to sit down in a place of authority. And uh, again, the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus said, sit or occupy Moses' seat, Moses' seat of authority. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do that you do not after their works for they say and do not. Now, that really eliminates a lot of excuses uh, as to what some people say. They don't have to listen to, to a preacher because he's this or that, or he's not this, or he's not that. Well, in this very chapter, Matthew 23, just within the next 15 plus verses, Jesus calls these same Pharisees and scribes children of the devil, children of serpents. He called them hypocrites. And yet he said, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do ye not, do not ye after their works. Why? Why would he say that? Be because they say and do not. In other words, what we are submitted to is the word of God. And whatever individual God has placed over us, if we are in his will where we are, whoever that individual is that God has given rule over that church, given a rule over that place, they sit in, figuratively speaking, Moses' seat. They represent God's authority. And we are to do what they say. Now, there are, if I can use the term, caveats for that, and I will share some of those here in a little bit. First of all, the scripture does say in Matthew 15, if you will permit me to go there, uh, Matthew 15, and I'm going to read to you a couple of uh, verses before I get to the verse that you may expect me to add to. Matthew 15, 1, then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, here they are again, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do the disciples, thy disciples transgress the, the tradition of the elders? Now notice, please, <laughs> here Jesus is talking about 
tradition, and they're challenging, the scribes and Pharisees are challenging Jesus and his followers because they weren't following the traditions of the elders. And yet in Matthew 23, Jesus said, whatever the scribes and Pharisees tell you to do, do that, observe to do that. Don't do what they do because they sit in Moses' place of authority. But what is it that you're submitting to when they're in that place of authority? Whatever they say to you that is in and of the word. If what they're saying to you is tradition, let's listen to what Jesus says about that. Verse 2 again, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Notice, there's no place in the Bible that says we're supposed to do that. That was the teachings of men. It can't be proven in the Bible that the scripture requires uh, that the Lord God required us to wash our hands when we eat bread. In fact, Jesus said, it's not what that goes in the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth. So the point here is, uh, they were, they were challenging Jesus about his disciples based on something that wasn't in the word of God. But he answered and said to them, verse 3, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to, to his father and his, or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did he Isaiah, or Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, uselessly, worthlessly, of no impact or effect, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth. I've already quoted this, but this is more accurate, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of, uh, out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after thy, they, they heard this saying? Yes, it is possible to be offended at the word of truth, but it's also possible to be offended because the word of truth contradicts what you've been standing for. So then it says, Jesus said, uh, in response to this, didn't you know the Pharisees were offended? He said, but he, but he answered verse 13 and said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They shall they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. What blindness? those that give credence to tradition over to the teachings of the word of God. Now, this implies, the words of Jesus here imply, that if your leader is teaching you false doctrine, then your soul is at stake and every man answers for his own soul. So here's the question. You have to ask, answer this question to yourself. Is my leader teaching the, the, the truth of the plan of salvation according to the book of Acts? Is he teaching the truth about who the Godhead is? Is he teaching that I'm supposed to be faithful to God, have a relationship with God, and that I'm supposed to fellowship with the body and other things that go along with this? Now, he may not be teaching to dot the I's and cross the T's of your personal conviction. That doesn't make him wrong because conviction and doctrine are two different things. But if he tells you you can be saved <coughs> some other way other than the way the book of Acts practiced it, if he tells you there's some other God other than the one true and living God of both the Old and New Testament, then he's a blind leader and you're going to have to, you're going to, have to separate yourself from a blind leader. But if you cannot, if you cannot <coughs> answer the question that if I practice what my pastor is teaching me, 
I'm going to be lost. If, if that's not the case, if what your pastor is teaching you will not cause you to be lost, no matter what your opinion of his spiritual condition is, if what he's teaching you is substantiated by the word of God, it's not your place to judge his spirituality. And according to Jesus, whatever he tells you to do, you have to live in Moses' seat. Because here's the difference. There's a big difference between false doctrine and personal struggles as an individual. If I'm teaching you doctrine that if you obey my doctrine, it's going to send you to hell because it's a lie, it's not truth, then my soul is in jeopardy. But if I'm teaching you truth, and if you obey what I'm teaching you, not copy how I'm living, which may or may not be possible, but if I'm teaching you truth, and you will, you'll be saved if, you're, if you obey what I'm saying, then my personal struggles are between me and God, not between you and me. God did not choose to lead us by angelic beings. And this flesh is flesh. And I don't know anybody who would be honest that won't admit they have good days and bad days. They have days where they are Walking with God in days they're not walking with him near like they need to. Days where they're doing what the word of God says they should do and following the will of God. And days where they may not be. But that's not my right to judge. Every man is judged by his own master. Every servant is judged by his own master. And the man of God is a servant of God. And he's not mine to judge. So that's the primary two criterias right there. If a man is teaching you tradition for truth, and if you obey him, you'll be disobeying the Bible. When it comes to the plan of salvation, uh, the oneness of God, and, 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 and those kind of basic things, then I'm in jeopardy and I need to find someplace else to go to church. However, if what the man is teaching, if I obey what he's teaching me, it's not going to put my soul in jeopardy, then I have no excuse, no matter what I think of his spirituality. So uh, that's th this is very critical. Why? Because he did not put angelic beings on Moses' seat. And uh, I, I studied, looked this up again today. I've said it in the past, but just to refresh my memory, and I can't find the phrase Moses' seat anywhere else in the scripture. Uh, I actually, actually had to go to several Bible dictionaries and other commentaries that would explain this, and they went into it, and they, they took from, from the, the Jewish uh, customs, traditions, or whatever. Jesus actually quoted something that was not in the scripture, and he brought it into the scripture as an example because this is something else I had read before, but I was my memory was refreshed on it today. Uh, that Moses' seat, Jesus practiced that. Uh, the scripture says it was their custom to stand up when they read the scripture out loud, but when the person who was going to speak to the congregation uh, got ready to speak, he sat down to speak. And if you go to Luke chapter 4, that's exactly what Jesus did. He when he came, he came into the synagogue as was his custom in Nazareth after he had come out of the wilderness forty days prayer and fasting, and he uh, he stood up and read the scripture. And when he finished reading, he sat down and began to exhort them. And so that seat that he sat on uh, was considered Moses' seat or. The representative of the place of Moses' authority that was passed down through generations and all, spiritual offices, and and uh, and Jesus acknowledged that he considered that same authority uh, in effect that day. The same authority God gave Moses, God passed down by impartation through those He chose and offices, and whatever. Now I will say this: it is a fearful thing to be put in Moses' seat and teach one thing and live another. It's a fearful thing. 
And I don't know anybody that has done that perfectly. And if they tell you they have, I'm calling them a liar. But the point is, it's not my own weaknesses or struggles at times. It's my habitual life. If I'm habitually living in sin without repenting, without attempting to be right with God and walk with God in obedience to his word, then I'm in serious trouble. I'm in serious trouble. But don't forget something. Even after God took the kingdom spiritually, took the kingdom away from King Saul, David, even though Saul was pursuing David and trying to take his life, David refused to touch the anointed of God. He refused to touch the anointed of God. He would not take Saul's life. Even though Saul was trying to take his life, David recognized that it wasn't about the man, it was about the office, and the anointing is God resting upon man. It's not man. It's God resting on man, not man. And so David refused to touch the anointed of God, even though God had already withdrawn the office. I've taken the kingdom away from you. The Lord left him in that position. He left him in that position. But even with him in a backslidden condition, having consulted a witch, David wouldn't touch him. So here's the thing. If you consider that your pastor is somehow creating some kind of a ceiling on you. What are you doing about it? You talking to people about it? Now you're in trouble. You've touched the anointed. What can you do? The Bible says for us to pray pray for our leaders. Not just leaders in government, but especially those in leadership over us in the kingdom of God. We need to pray for them, for their salvation, for God to deal with their hearts, to, to lead them so they can lead us. If we're, if we're talking about people instead of praying for them, then we're not spiritual, no matter how spiritual we think we are. No matter what we think they're doing wrong, if we're talking about them to people rather than talking to God about them, we're, we're, in, dangerous, we're in a dangerous situation there. So if I'm talking to God and I'm asking God to bless my leader and to give them a hunger for him and a thirst for his spirit and a hunger for his word and a desire to know God and and to desire a move of God and whatever else I feel led to pray for him, God bless them today and and heal them of every wound and, and deliver them from every grudge and give them your grace to repent for every sin. And uh, I loose upon them the spirit of revival and the spirit of restoration, the spirit of renewal, the spirit of refreshing, uh, the spirit of the reaper. And you can go on and on. You pray for them and, and pray that on them. Pray for them to become what you want to become. Now, when you're praying for them, you're not judging them. If you're gossiping about them, you're judging them, and that's that's in being a rebellion to authority. So my answer, and this could go on and on, but I won't, uh, we, we do have a right to expect our leaders to live a life that we can follow their example and be saved. Hebrews 13, verse 7, and Hebrews 13, verse 17. Both communicate that to us. Obey them that have the rule over you. Uh, And he talks about us following their faith. So uh, all of us should want to have a leader who is an example that we can follow. It is a very sad thing when our leader is lives in a way that brings shame uh, to themselves, to the kingdom of God, and to the people that, that, that are uh, under them, under God's authority under them. It's, that's, a shame. that's a shame. It really is a shame. Uh, one man was told in the scripture, oh, it was, uh, I think it was Nathan that told David concerning his sin with Bathsheba. By this, you've given the enemies of God a great occasion to blaspheme his name. I want want this life 
that God is holding me accountable for and a steward for. I want it to glorify God. I can't sit here and tell you that every moment of every day I have conducted myself in a way that glorifies God. I would be an absolute liar if I told you that, and any other man would, would be a liar too. Because Paul said in me that is in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. The things I would do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. And, and he goes through all of that there. If the apostle Paul had struggles with his flesh and had to learn how to have victory over his flesh, even though he was a, an apostle of God, who do I think I am that I've never had any struggle? The problem is this. When I present myself as somebody that never has any struggles, and I present myself as someone who, who's got it all together and I got this right and I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the pinnacle of spirituality and holiness, that will produce hypocrisy someday because I will not be able to stay there all, forever. I can't. There are going to be bad days. There are going to be tough days. There are going to be days that I'm not going to be everything I should be. And if I'm being dishonest about how I'm living, then I, then I put myself in a position to pretend to be doing well when I'm not. And I'm not talking about just blatant, blatantly uh, <laughs> advertising any struggle I may have to everybody. That's not what, what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is the, the idea that uh, I need to be real with people. I don't have to tell all my business. And the scripture says love hides or covers a multitude of sins. Psalms 32, 1 says, Blessed is the man whose transgression is, transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. God does not expose sin except as his last act of mercy. If we will be sensitive to God even in our most difficult times, he will deal with us privately. We can repent privately. He will forgive us privately. Nobody wants God to just pull the cover off of everything we've ever had a problem with. I don't. Nobody, I, nobody in their right mind wants that to happen. And if we allow God, he will let our shortcomings stay covered. But if we will not be repentant, he'll pull the cover off because that's his last act. Exposure of sin is God's last act of mercy because if he can't get us to repent any other way, he will expose the sin for us to repent. Now, unfortunately, that's his motive uh, that's his motive, but unfortunately, a lot of times when he pulls the cover off, instead of um, being humbled and repenting, people get angry at God because they're embarrassed because they've been caught. One writer in the in the scripture, I don't even remember where it's at, said uh, Israel was uh, uh, sorrow, sorry like a thief is sorry when he's caught. So when God exposes sin for somebody that's not sorry for their sin, they get angry with God. They don't humble themselves. But it's still his last act of mercy. When you can't pretend to be what you're not anymore, and he pulls the cover off, it's him trying to save us. But his preference is, his preference is for us to be covered, forgiven and covered, covered with his covering, which is his robe of righteousness that we're, that's put on us. That's why Paul said, for as many as are baptized into to Christ have put on Christ. That's Galatians 3.27. Ephesians 4.24, we're supposed to put on the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. So that new man is the righteousness of God that is our covering. That's why in heaven, we're all going to be given Every saint of God in heaven is going to be given a robe of righteousness, which is white, which is the righteousness of, our, of the saints. So that's his preference for us. But I have to trust God with every leader that I've got. I've got to trust God with every person over me. I've got to trust God with them. I've got to pray for them. Now, I will say this. If I am submitted to authority, keep a right attitude, and pray for my leader. And if my motive is not to exceed the leader or try to outdo the leader or show up the leader, 
God will not be hindered in taking me to wherever he needs me to go in the spiritual things for me to grow. The problem I've seen way too many times over the years, you let somebody in the congregation become more spiritual than the pastor they think, and that per person is going to cause trouble if they view themselves that way. They're more spiritual than the pastor. So therefore, they have a right to not do what the pastor says, and then they also have a right to tell the pastor what he ought to be doing. That's not a right attitude and spirit, and that is not spiritual. If I'm spiritual, I'm humble. And I don't judge anybody else by me. And I'm not comparing myself with others and measuring myself by others, including the man of God. Now again, ideally, Ideally, according to Paul in, in, cha in thir chapter 13 of Hebrews, the, the, our leaders should be setting an example of spirituality. Obedience to the word, prayer, doing the will of God, walking with God, all that. Ideally, that's the case. But I don't know a man's heart, and I don't know my own heart. And whatever we predetermine what somebody else's cause or reason or motive was for doing something, we just made ourselves God. Because the Bible says, no man knows his own heart. And when I pres presume to know what your reason or your motive for doing something is, then I have just made myself God because I don't even know my own heart. How can I know your heart? How can I know your reason for doing something? Not only that, I don't know how God views that leader that I may be considering is not spiritual. Maybe they don't appear spiritual to me, but maybe to God they're fine. Or maybe they appear spiritual to me, but God sees stuff and knows stuff I don't know. But again, that's between them and God. My responsibility is not submit to a human, but to the authority they represent. And if I'm submitted to that authority, and I'm listening to the word that they teach, and if that word is truth, it doesn't matter, according to Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 2 and 3, what how they live, it matters what my attitude is toward the truth of the word they teach. And if I, I know I'm repeating myself, if, I, if I'm obeying what they teach and I'm under authority, there is no limitation to my growth in spirituality. And if, from God's perspective, that ever happened to be the case, God will take care of it. You don't have to worry about it. And I don't have to expand on that statement. It's just the truth. He'll take care of it. But it's not our right to undermine the pastor because we don't think he's spiritual or he's some kind of limitation on it. It's not our right. We put ourselves in jeopardy when we do that. So I'm strongly encouraging you not to do that. I think that's probably enough on that subject. You probably would agree with that, hopefully. Hopefully.